When it comes to the passing game, Thomas, mm -hmm. this is one where I think from an analytical standpoint, easier to 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 uh, evaluate um, because you're talking about it. You're you're more independent. You're not completely independent, but more independent. It's like baseball where you're win and loss, right? You're playing a defensive end over and over and over again. There's some context that has to go into it. But when you're looking at it from a, a scout, you know, an evaluator standpoint, what are you looking for? Same thing off the ball. The initial movement, the first step to slide, right? As you're as you're sliding, as you're sliding, just so everyone knows, you're sliding with the the pass rush, of course. Sliding to the left, the bit the ability to redirect and come back inside to have the hips to to flip. I'm still working off the left side here, right? As your mm -hmm. athlete, your ability to get your hands up and you utilize your hands in a fast way. We drafted um, Sam Baker, who was a good player. We moved up, probably should have drafted him in the second round. He, he plays some good football for us. He had short arms, and you hear it all the time. It is a legit thing if you have short arms and you don't utilize your hands quick, fast, explosively. If you have short arms, man, you better you bet your hands better be beautifully fast and explosive. Very important to do that. Very important to keep it in front of you. You have to have the eyes. You have to you have to be able to follow your pass rusher. You have to you have to have a nice strong base. And again, you have to be underneath yourself. You have to sit. You have to be able to sit so that when that pass rusher decides he's going to flip it and speed the power you, your ass isn't getting flown back in into the quarterback, which happens many times. And many of us as GMs have had people like that where you're pulling your hair out thinking, just sit your ass down, you know, anchor in, get your hands up, play with this guy. Don't let him push you back four and five yards. So that left tackle, man, he's got all of that going on. And he has to have the ability to sit down. He is not going to be as big and solid and sound and anchor-like as the right side. Again, prototypically, those guys are going to have to have the same thing. But that right side is nowhere near going to slide and redirect, slide and mirror, as well as the left tackle. He still has to be able to have a nice, strong base. And he still has to have ability to redirect and get his hips back around. He still needs strong-ass hands to prevent the, the speed to power. That's going to happen on that side, as you know. They're going to try to ramrod that tackle back. Hopefully you have a big enough, strong enough guy on the right side as a pass protector. Again, always needs to have both of those guys. I'll finish with this. They have to have an awareness to pass off and accept, of course, accept the, uh, the uh, stunts, right? That's a big, big thing. You can't have a numb nut on either side. That's probably the wrong word. You have to have a guy who has a nice, strong brain about him I'm not talking about a school brain. I'm talking about an understanding of football. Has to be alert. Has to be aware. Thomas, firstly, I want to, I want to commend. I, I, I'm so excited because I get you in these situations where because you're very, you know, you're very progressive and you're very like you obviously you're a CEO of a football analytics company now. But there's a part of me that's like, oh, I can't wait to watch film with you and to be able to codify all the words you just said. Because I do think that with tracking data and with all these things we can do, we can we can quantify like all the things, like not getting ramrodded, which is like a, we could actually create a, a column in our data frame that says ramrodded zero one, and we could get through that. That was so, that was such a, a good explanation of like what you're looking for. And when I'm looking, and I know there's a lot of analytics folks listening to the show, like, I think that there's very much a way that we can codify those things in our data because, you know, one of the things when I was looking at the um, one of the things when I was looking at the tracking data for the big data bowl and one of the, you know, a few people had come up to me, by the way, if, you know, I, I don't have infinite amount of time, but if you ever want to, you know, just throw me a question on Twitter, I can certainly help. Um, well, one of the things I wanted to look at was what, you know, what kind of depth does a guy get, right? A lot of what you're saying is like, is he athletic enough to get depth, Right. Or, you know, when, you know, how, how much, you know, when he's engaged, I know stats bomb does this a little bit, you know, when, when engagement happens, how far does he move and stuff like that? And what I was running into was the same problem I tried to solve at pro football focus, which was, you know, not all the plays are created equally. And, and one of the things I did at pro football focus is I built, and, and it's part of their product right now. I built what was called true pass sets. So I only look at passing plays that lasted, I believe it was more than two and a half seconds. Mm -hmm. I only looked at passing plays that didn't involve screens. Um, I, I think they they actually, in a sense, have taken out plays where there's a chip block or something like that, but literally just looking at the one-on-one -on -one plays. And when you do that, 
you can really look at a lot of the stuff that you're looking at, which is like when he's isolated, does he get moved off his spot? That you know, what about creating like a passing map for a, a tackle where you look at like how much depth does he get in the first two seconds of the play, and how successfully is it is he at various depths and those kind of things. One question I had because I've done a lot of tackle eval when I was at PFF and Andrew Thomas, by the way, I feel really good about this. There's still an article on the web that says Andrew Thomas is the best tackle in the 2020 class. It looked horrible at first. It looks okay now. Um, But do you look at competition when you're looking at tack? Like, do you throw out plays if a guy's playing a weaker defensive end or something like that? Like, how do you handle the competition aspect of tackle? Because, you know, shrinking down that space, of course, helps you understand when he's going to play an NFL caliber end, but it also lowers the sample space. Oh, there's no question about that. Whether that's in the NCAA and he's coming up into the draft or whether it's a free agent and you're able to run them against, you know, run the the data against, you know, the entire league and, and, and be able to monitor where he is. No question. I used to say to all of our guys, when we sit in and watch, you know, all of our scouting staff, we'd be watching, you know, and and ranking all the the tackles we were looking at again, whether it was in free agency or in the, in the, in the college draft. And we would go on and on about, you know, look at that. He, he just, you know, he completely stonewalled that guy. I'm like, he didn't stonewall the guy. The guy was flailing, standing straight up, like, like the most stiff, uh, stiff, non-athletic guy in the world, exposing his chest with no quick twitch whatsoever. Are you going to truly give him a, pre- a preventing of this guy rushing the passer? Or it could be the other way around, of course, right? So we were, I, I always taught, and talk to our scouts about making sure they had, especially the younger ones, have a really acute awareness each play when something happens really good or really bad and look what happened. And that could also be a trip. That could also be something that happened. So make sure that you're giving the person their due or not their due uh, when something like that does. Yeah. Happen. By the Yeah. Will, uh, William reiterating what, what I just said, which is a couple of your, your offensive linemen that you selected have had really good years. Um, it, it's it's interesting. Um, you, you asked me this question a couple weeks ago. You said, like, what's more important, your wins or losses? For offensive line, it's very clear, right? In the running game, it's, it's I think, even, right? You do want to, like, just – you do want to destroy a guy because that's obviously going to create great holes in the run game. But as I showed with it, with this graphic just a little bit ago, mm-hmm. if, you, if you fuck up in the running game, it screws up the whole play in many ways, right? The run – in the passing game, it's almost entirely about your losses, right? You want to mitigate your losses as much as possible, just the same way as if you're a defensive end, you want to get more wit. You want your your wins matter. Um, does I, I is is there a is there a mental makeup with an offense? Because this is something obviously we can't derive with analytics yet. Um, is is there a mental makeup aspect to offensive line play? I guess we could look at you know does his do his losses correlate or are they independent right do like do he does he does he tend to lose a bunch in a row and win a bunch in a row or are his losses kind of uniformly distributed through his through his play set we, we could obviously test that I would imagine um you know for most players it's about the same but like when you're thinking about mental makeup for a tackle what what what's you know what's that for you knowing that you really you want to pitch perfect games you want the Mitchell Schwartz playoffs of 2019 where the guy went through the whole playoffs without giving up a pressure the entire time like is there is there something you look for there well look usually that left tackle is going to be a little bit less angst ridden or a little less um fired up and agitated and ready to just like pull people apart i feel like the right tackle usually has more of that and the left tackle's got a little bit more of an easy mind about them and, and, and thinking about mirroring and doing what they need to do, walling off. And so I, I've sensed that before. I will say O-line in, in general and the two tackle positions, you know, they're, they're generally speaking, I feel like they're, you know, they're able to get in those rooms. They're able to share. They, they have usually good football brains about them, right? They understand directions. They have awareness, as I alluded to earlier, or maybe didn't allude to, just, bat, you know, massively important of making sure that they are smart and aware of how the game is going. That's really, really important. I'm not saying you don't have fighters. You've seen some fighters at, at tackles over the years, man. I mean, we want to talk about our guy. And why am I blanking right now? Tennessee Titans, 
Michigan. What was our guy's Taylor name? Taylor Lewan. Taylor Lewan. Loved him. And, and actually, there's a oh. really good question here from, from Taylor who says, oh, my God, this is an exciting – he's referring to this show. Yeah. I've wondered forever about the Jake Matthews and Taylor Lewan debate. What were the deciding factors in that big decision when you're through – the basic premise to dig into, please. So oh. basically, I mean, because you had to make that choice, right? It's a, it's a great point. Go ahead, and then I'll follow off of you if you want. No, I mean, it, it's I, – I think about – and again, like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm friends with Jeff Schwartz. I'm friend, you know, I, I, I've, I've admired you know, Mitchell Schwartz for a long time as a Chiefs fan. What I admire about him is, you know, he was obviously very physical and very tough, and you have to be. And like – and I play – you know, I, I played tight end in college. I wasn't that good, but I – you know, and you do like – you have to be an asshole. Like you have to be a prick and, you know, and yet it requires a great deal of a key. Like you can't, you know, the biggest difference for me in switching from wide receiver to tight end is that wide receiver. I didn't have to give a shit about what anybody else on the field was doing, except for maybe the wide out next to me. But like when I was a tight end, I had to know, and I lined up right. I had to know what the left guard was supposed to do on a play. Like there takes a level of, intelligence because these plays and and again one of the things about this graph and one of the reasons i created this this thing was the re running is running is less important than the nfl than passing but the reason coaches run is because the synchro the synchrony that is required for a great run play makes everybody happy if you execute a run play it is the most valuable play in all of football it's just really hard to right and it requires really intelligent players along the front five and tight ends and fullbacks and everything to make sure it happens. And so you, you, you look at offensive linemen and tackle specifically, think about what your, your, and again, a, B and C you're facing the, the hardest athletic mismatch on the football field. You have to be tough as hell and you have to be very intelligent. Those are the three things that are required to play offensive line and so people are like, well, why does it take forever? To, like, you know, you're, you're talking about McGarry and, and Lindstrom, and it's like, well, shit. Like, imagine if you were you came in the league and though you're you're going from facing a guy from UTSA or NC State to Grady Jarrett, who's been around this thing for a lot, like the old man strength and intelligence of these guys. I was watching the Ravens Bengals last night. I'm like, Calais Campbell is six foot eight, three twenty. He's been in the league for. 12 years of course he's going to have your lunch the first three years you play in the league and so it, it just requires such a, 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 a these decisions are not easy is basically what i'm saying they're not easy i mean look i, I was uh texting back and forth with caleb mcgarry and L lindstrom the other day after caleb was announced to where he was and of course lindstrom got his all pro and i was saying to dan quinn as well in, in the same sort of circle circle of uh, text i said like i don't know if i've been around two guys that i really enjoyed being around as much as those two guys. They were young, of course, right, when we were there. And it was great to see them situating, just like Julio was and, and, and Matt and, and Deion Jones through, through the different development, not to jump around here. When you come back to thinking about really honing in on those players, Taylor Lewan and, and Jake Matthews, right? Let's go back to that quickly for a second. Those two guys are very, very different as far as people, right? They both were really good athletes. I think they were both seven athletes. Taylor might have been even a little bit more of a uh, closer to an eight athlete. Again, eight being excellent, seven being very good in our in our vernacular. Um, the interesting thing is their personalities were very different, right? Taylor would fight you, scrap you, pull your face off. Interestingly enough, about Jake, Jake is a tough ass guy. He'll fight anyone. He has, you know, I mean, he comes from great stock with his father. So both of those guys came to the table, very different personalities. Sometimes you have to understand everyone. You, 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 you pick many different elements there, not only their ability on the field, how their personalities fit in with the old line, how our, how our scheme was, what our system was, who our people were. You have to really dig in and say, what does our offensive line really want? How does this guy coming in, Jake or, or, or Taylor, how does he fit in with this old line group? And people think, ah, oh, it should be all dictated on the best player. Sometimes it can be really, really close, but it might go towards, in this situation, it could go towards Jake Matthews because the full picture, not just the ability to move, not just the athleticism, high, but everything, let's go with this player. And it's, believe me, from day to day, week to week, you, you might even have an owner knocking on your door a day or two before saying, look, 
we did our we did our run on this, and I'm 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 not saying this about Arthur Blank, but I know this, and we have determined that because so and so is from the University of Georgia, and he is as good. If it's this close, we would rather go to the marketing side. It's tough for a GM to hear that, right? We're going to market this guy because we think he's going to sell more tickets and jerseys. I know I've said that, but it, it's it's amazing how many things come to your table as a GM when you're making a decision between Jake and Taylor.